and begin, I will ask um, everyone else except the speaker to mute themselves, please, for best audio quality. And I want to welcome everyone to today's NIH Office of Dietary Supplements webinar. I'm Barbara Sorkin. In addition to organizing ODS's seminars, I co-direct NIH's Consortium Advancing Research on Botanicals and Other Natural Products, our CARBON program. Before I begin today's seminar, I want to do something that I rarely, that I've never done before, but I would like to ask people to take a minute to recognize that this is the 13th anniversary of September 11th attack. So if we could take just a minute, please. And with that, I'd like to bring you back to today's main focus. Um, but before I introduce today's speaker, a few brief other announcements. First, our coming attractions. Our next ODS webinar will be on Wednesday, October 16th at 11 a.m. U.S. Eastern Time. It will be given by Dr. Stuart Phillips. Dr. Phillips will be talking about protein and amino acid supplements and sarcopenia in aging. If you're not on our seminars list and you'd like to get the email with that information, please see the chat in a few minutes. The icon for the chat should be at the far bottom right of your screen. We'll be putting an email address there that you can use to request to be added to our ODS seminars email list. Next, some webinar logistics. In the interest of audio quality, we've muted all of you except the speaker, and we ask that you please stay muted until the final questions and answers, we do hope to have time for those. You have access to the chat though, and I encourage you to put any questions you have for the speaker in the chat as they arise. If I see any that seem urgent, I'll try to get Connie's attention and ask them to interrupting her talk. Otherwise, we'll take as many as we can, you have time for at the end of her presentation. Please also use the chat if you're having technical problems with the webinar audio or visual or the closed captions, and one of us here at NIH will try to help. And um, a few reminders about please being considerate um, and ensuring that everyone gets what they are looking for out of this webinar. And one caveat, and with that, I have the pleasure of introducing, the great pleasure of introducing today's speaker, Dr. Connie Weaver. Dr. Weaver is a distinguished research professor in exercise and nutritional sciences at San Diego State University in California, and she's a distinguished professor emerita of foods and nutrition at Purdue University, where she served as department head for 25 years, as well as teaching food chemistry and nutrition courses. She's an elected member of the National Academy of Medicine. She's a fellow of the American Society for Nutrition, or ASN of the Institute of Food Technologists, the American Heart Association, and the American Society of Bone and Mineral Research. Connie is a member of the Science Advisory Boards of the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, of the Arkansas Children's Nutrition Center, and of the California Prune Board, and she has served in the past as president of the ASN. She has led randomized controlled nutrition trials with a focus on bone health, both pediatric and adult. She was the Purdue Principal Investigator of the Indiana Clinical and Translational Sciences Institute, where she directed the Bone and Body Composition Corps from 2008 to 2019. And from 2000 to 2010, she was director of the Purdue UAB Botanical University of Alabama Botanical Research Center for Age-Related Diseases. 
And she was also the inaugural director of Purdue's Women's Global Health Institute, which had research foci, including cancer, bone, neurodegeneration, and general wellness. So Connie um, has boots on the ground experience with doing clinical trials of nutrition interventions. Um, and, and full disclosure, I should say that I have, like most people involved in nutrition research, um, I think my closest collaboration with Connie was on a, um, a collection of papers on rigor in clinical nutrition research for frontiers in nutrition. Um, and that was a lot of fun. So um, full disclosure, some bias there on my part. Um, what we're gonna hear about today uh, is efforts in which Connie has played a key role, efforts to improve best practice guidelines for rigorous nutrition research. These include work with the NIH Clinical and Translational Science Awards and the ASN on developing best practices for nutrition research clinical trials. Connie is also serving as the ASN representative to a Federation of European Neuroscience Societies working group that is developing a nutrition extension for the Consolidated Standards of Reporting Trials, or CONSORT, which is the gold standard for rigorous reporting of clinical trials of all sorts. Her work with the CTSAs, the Clinical Translational Science Awards, and the ASN produced five manuscripts and a workshop series that's offered by the ASN titled Best Practices for Human Nutrition Randomized Controlled Trials. You'll find a couple of relevant papers in the reference list on the flyer you received for her talk. So with that too lengthy introduction, I will yield the microphone and the um, screen to you, Connie, if you don't hear anything from me in the next few minutes, that is because um, your slides and your audio are working perfectly. I promise I will let you know if there are any issues. So please go ahead. Okay, I'm trying to get it to full screen mode. There we go. You can see this fine? Totally. Great. Well, thank you, Barbara. Um, I really appreciate and feel honored by being the first ODS seminar speaker of the season. And as Barbara explained, we're going to talk about best practices for nutrition trials in humans and best reporting practices. She already went through my disclosures and a lot of my outline. So the, we're going to talk about the importance of rigorous evidence base for establishing any kind of dietary guidance. And I was asked to comment some of the insider point of view for how are working groups selected? What is the process like in order to come up with uh, establishing rules and uh, guidelines, guidance for how to increase the rigor? So there are many groups actually that comment on these and you can find a slew of publications, but I only have time in this seminar to kind of bounce through the highlights of some of the activities I've been involved with. And uh, Barbara Lissett mentioned those. So I'm gonna start with this partnership between the NIH funded clinical and translational science award centers and American Society for Nutrition that established um, and published a lot of best practices to the best of our ability. And then picking up on this Federation of European Nutrition Society's work on providing a nutrition extension to consort. And then I'm gonna talk about some specific examples for developing frameworks for recommending bioactive food and supplement intakes for health that were initiated by the International Science, uh, Life Sciences Institute. And then it's our turn to have an open discussion. Where do we go from here? And I hope you'll um, provide your own thoughts on that. It's so important to improve the rigor of nutrition science. If not, our reputation is at risk. And we've all seen in the news many examples like this one, impossible results in human nutrition research that raises a challenge to the credibility and that in turn causes the media to come out with diet in the news, what to believe. It, it's kind of my hypothesis for many years now that we uh, are so interested as a public 
in nutrition that we hang on every paper that comes out with a new result to incorporate into our uh, habits. And the media picks up on this interest in uh, the public in nutrition because they eat, they think they're partly experts. And so it looks like nutrition swishes back and forth all the time. If it were more like physics or one of the scientists where other sciences where the public isn't quite so invested, you wait for expert panels to review the literature every five or more years and come up with the main conclusions. If we did that in nutrition, the main advice hasn't changed all that much from decade after decade. But when we use the latest paper to interpret what nutrition means for health, then it looks like we're switching back and forth. And credibility is at stake. Reporting in nutrition can be improved. In this one example of randomized, um, 400 randomized controlled trials published between 2019 and 2020, they found that 68% of those trials weren't registered, not even retrospectively. Protocols were only available in 14% of them. A statistical analysis plan was available in just 3% of the trials. And in this first partnership that I'm gonna discuss, that was one of the main pillars of recommendation is to establish a statistical analysis plan that's very consistent to the problem you're studying and the hypothesis you're addressing. And it's only if it's only reported in 3% of these trials that they looked at, shame on us as a field. Insufficient detail and outcomes and intended treatment effects were reported. 97% of studies these authors found to present insufficient information for determining risk of bias assessment later. And so now that we base a lot of um, food nutrition guidance on meta-analysis and systematic reviews, if you can't evaluate the risk of bias, it's an incomplete evidence base. 69% lacked information to assess selective reporting bias. So definitely there's room for improvement. It takes a strong evidence base to be the foundation for effective nutrition policy. The highest level of robust research is considered the randomized control trial, the gold standard in order to lead to effective nutrition policy. And if you have inadequate research, evidence gaps, then you produce a nutrition guidance where there's a lack of confidence because it lacks the rigor needed to be clear. So with this background, that randomized control trials are the gold standard for development of evidence-based recommendation and the acknowledgement that there's inadequate scientific rigor and evidence gaps currently that undermine confidence in dietary guidance to promote health and reduce chronic disease. These several efforts that I'm going to tell you about um, try to help provide some correction, uh, some advice that we can follow to help improve the scientific rigor of the evidence base. We noted that there was a lack of best practice guidelines assimilated in one place for conducting human nutrition randomized controlled trials. So we wanted to provide that, which we did more or less, five papers and advances in nutrition uh, over a few months is more or less one place. And now we're working on um, a nutrition extension to concert because there isn't one. And there's been a lack of frameworks for developing dietary guidelines for dietary bioactive foods, which has recently been published and we're working on one for supplements. One of the foundation principles that the first partnership worked with is the importance of documentation. So many of our guiding principles are how to document, why you should document and reminding you to document. Because if you didn't document it, it didn't happen. 
nobody can reproduce it or um, perform quality assurance checks on your work. So this first partnership that we're going to get into is between the uh, CTSAs and American Society for Nutrition producing recommendations for best practices for design and conduct of human nutrition randomized controlled trials. It resulted in five publications and advances in nutrition, and then American Society for Nutrition developed an um, online course, two-day work interactive workshops that were held in July of 2021 and 2022, which are archived. So how was the working group formed? This working group we named Nourish from the NUR in nutrition, I in intervention, R and um, RSH in research to get to nourish. So what um, happened to start this effort was uh, I was at Indiana, the associate director for the clinical and translational sciences award in Indiana, and Alice Lechtenstein was uh, involved in the Tufts CTSA. And the two PIs at that time were preparing the competing renewal for both of these centers. And there was encouragement from NIH to have some cross CTSA activity. And so the two PIs knew each other and said, what could we do? And they said, well, we're pretty strong in nutrition in both of these CTSAs. So let's get Connie and Alice to conceive of a plan for what we can propose. So we did that. Uh, we envisioned and proposed to do this development of best practice guidelines for the field. And we sent a letter of invitation then after both CTSAs were re uh, renewed to all the 60 CTSAs across the country saying, if you have a um, a research leader in nutrition associated with your CTSA, please um, support them to come to a workshop at TESS and become involved in this process. And we interacted with the American Society of Nutrition asking for them to make some uh, assignments for representing the leadership. And Penny, Chris Etherton from Penn State added about that time. So these are the people who came to the work the workshop in Tufts from the CTSIs and from ASN. Rick Mattis was the president of ASN at the time. And we formed working groups that led over the next year or so to these publications in advances in nutrition around 2021, early, early in that year. So we have the initial article that outlines the process and the need for these articles. And then the working group led by Alice was on design and conduct of the human nutrition randomized control trials. Then the next one was on documentation and regulation, and then one on laboratory considerations and data management. And then the last one on statistical analysis how to develop a statistical analysis plan. So these are meant to help train um, investigators and get best practices going on in the laboratories. So ASN wanted to help train in an interactive webinar capacity. So two day workshops were developed to cover all of those points in the um, papers and to have breakout sessions where junior investigators could ask these more senior authors, how did they advise for a particular situation that they had? But it was also meant to provide a forum to stimulate discussion and address the uh, questions and concerns of individuals. By developing and training on best practices in all aspects of human nutrition randomized controlled trials and making this a comprehensive resource publicly available, we hope to increase the rigor of the evidence that underpins dietary guidance. But it won't do it without a commitment 
uh, people in the field. So we hoped that an ongoing dialogue would come to help keep improving the recommendations and owning them and trying to improve what we could advise people on these best practices. And so that's part of the question and answer period today is to continue that dialogue. Then an effort with the Federation of European Nutrition Societies for Improving Rigor in Nutrition Research was instigated by the president, Bill uh, Calder, whose term was four years. So you have long enough in bins to actually accomplish a project like this. So he had a number, he assigned a number of scientific working groups and I was assigned to working group three, a subgroup on scientific reporting that assignment was to develop a reporting guideline for nutrition interventions. And I was the representative for American Society of Nutrition. So by creating more teeth in the reporting at the journal stage is a good quality control checkpoint. It isn't actually designed to improve the trial design. You don't have the checkpoint there, but if you are going to have the checkpoint at the time you have to publish the paper, in effect, it works back to improving the trial design because we don't have officially a checkpoint in our field for letting the trial go ahead. We have become more uh, adept at publishing in advance the trial design. Maybe you get some feedback then, but often they're not published until you're largely uh, partway through the trial. So it'll take longer, but if you're having to account for things at the reporting stage, you will, your next studies improve them. So this FINS working group, many of them are from Europe assigned by the respective uh, European nutrition societies, but they wanted an international point of view for this consort. So you'll see that there are some members from New Zealand, South Africa, and me from uh, the US, in addition to people from the, the nutrition societies in Europe, oh, and Malaysia as well. So we've been working for a couple of years or so and uh, addressing the question, would the availability and adoption of a consort with nutrition extension guidelines lead to more consistent, transparent, and granular reporting of nutrition randomized controlled trials, which would ease up on those public uh, attacks on the critical evaluation of nutrition trials and their interpretation, both by the scientific and non-scientific com community. So in a recent paper uh, in Advances Nutrition, we outlined the process that this working group has gone through. So the FENS working group was established. And at first we spent a lot of Zoom calls drafting our proposal elements for a nutrition extension to consort. And then we wanted to first get international um, opinions. We assigned international members to the team, but we wanted a broad representation by the community. So we first went to the IUNS conference in Tokyo and had a pre-conference session where we explained what we were doing. And then we had a world cafe where it's a round table and people rotate and they address the different uh, proposed topics that we covered or the points and we get, got feedback and then we uh, modified them some. The next step was to get feedback from global nutrition journal editors. And we did this um, on a Zoom call that ASN coordinated, as well as through written means to provide feedback. And I'll tell you a little bit about their feedback momentarily. 
So we refined the draft nutrition specific consort extension and uh, we evaluated eight published trials against the criteria and I'll go into that a little bit more detail in a minute. And currently we've just finished a Delphi survey in experts to refine even further. And later this month, I'm going to a meeting at the University of Oxford where we hope that we will finalize the proposed extension. So we'll see what happens there. But in case you're not familiar with CONSORT, the Consolidated Standards and Reporting Trials is a minimum set of recommendations for reporting randomized controlled trials, which constant is uh, comprised of a 25 item checklist in a flow diagram. The latest versions were developed in 2010, although there's been some extensions developed since then. This effort of consort development has been funded by the MRC in the UK, the Family Health Institute, University of Oxford, that's why I'm going to the meeting in Oxford, and Ottawa Hospital Research Institute in Canada. There are 36 consort extensions already published, but none for nutrition, so it's about time. This is the classic outcome of the consort system, this flow diagram. And you should be seeing such a flow diagram in every published nutrition paper. So it covers quite a bit of the key elements in terms of what is the eligibility, how many were randomized, how was allocation handled, what is the loss to follow-up, and how many people were analyzed in the final outcome measures, but it lacks some specificity for nutrition. And they're, not all journals adopt CONSORT. 585 have adopted the CONSORT statement, and many of the nutrition journals that you may have published in, you know about, you have to submit that CONSORT checklist when you submit a paper. But there are key nutrition journals that have not adopted the consort, like Appetite, International Journal of Obesity, European Journal of Nutrition, Nutrients, et cetera. So we have more work to do. This is a brief look at the first parts of this consort 25 list checklist. So it's broken down by the sections of a typical paper, like the title and abstract and methods. And you have to report which page that you address these checklists on when you turn in the article. But the journal article, uh, the journal editors admitted, there's a very loose uh, checking of these consort items and reviewers really aren't trained well to do that. So that's another way we could increase the rigor in the field. When our working group met, we identified quite a few specific to nutrition trials that if we had guidance for, it may improve the rigor of the article. And so here's sort of a summary adapted from this Advances in Nutrition article. On the introduction, consort on the left shows what already exists. You're supposed to provide a scientific background and rationale. But more specifically to nutrition, how do you contextualize this to current dietary recommendations or food intake in the population you're studying? And in methods, you have to already describe the trial design, like is it parallel design, factorial, including allocation ratio. But we hope that authors will get more detailed. What are the confounders, like including baked baseline nutrition status? What's the habitual, habitual diet? What's the socioeconomic status season, like in vitamin D research? Physical activity might influence the outcomes. The knowledge of the participants and interventionists, especially for education interventions. Can you elaborate on, on these things in your paper? In the methods, you have to give eligibility criteria but we want them to include diet, physiological, 
nutritional characteristics that are targeted, spe specific for clinical at risk or healthy population, are the criteria based on or related to anthropometrics, biochemical clinical data, diet, food, allergies, et cetera. And under the discussion, you're supposed to describe the generalizability of the trial findings already, but we want to know, can you, the results be generalized based on the background diet? Is there variation in other populations? Can we differentiate between efficacy and effectiveness trials? We have a lot of room for improvement. In this one article in the Lancet, they said of the trials they evaluated that 38% were missing effect size and confidence interval and 49% did not mention adverse events in the methods. Something between 40 and 89% had inadequate treatment descriptions, wide range because uh, was it a partial description or incomplete or whatever, but it's um, a wide number that failed to elaborate fully. And in the results, outcomes were missing for 50% of the efficacy outcomes and 69% of harm outcomes per trial and completely reported. We can do better. So I'm gonna take you into one of the boxes in this advances in nutrition because um, for two reasons. One is it provides pretty much the detail of the elaboration we think is required to improve rigor for nutrition, uh, human nutrition trials, but also a huge message we got from our interaction with the journal editors was in principle, they thought it was a good idea to elaborate, to make more recommendations for nutrition trials, but they really worried about adding burden to the authors because if they, for their journal, adopted such a nutrition extension checklist and the authors didn't want to bother with it because it was too onerous for them to do, then they'll just go to another journal. And that really was a, the biggest threat. So we prepared this box that, that we um, envisioned could be made into a 19 item drop down box that had very simple choices and you could rip through really fast. So in the title, has a randomized controlled trial or a trial be identified in the title? Yes, yes, no. In the abstract, have the details of the nature and type of intervention or eating behavior and comparator been identified? Yes, no. Introduction, has the biological plausibility been addressed? Yes, no. For relevant, has the context been addressed? Yes, no, or not applicable. If it's a secondary analysis, is that clearly stated? In the methods, does the trial design align with the scientific question being addressed as stated in the introduction? Yes, no. This is surprisingly abused. And this is probably the most important point that we came to in the uh, CTSA ASN activities that we addressed. Also, is the dose and duration of the trial justified for both the primary and secondary outcomes? Are potential confounders including relevant baseline nutritional status, participant or environmental factors, carryover effects? Are nutritional physiological eligibility criteria included? Is the intervention fully described, including form, preparation, source, matrix, which tested components, storage, bioactive, biological exposure, acceptability, and tolerance? How protocol is developed for behavior studies? You can see if you had to do this a time or two, you would improve your trial designs because you're paying attention all of a sudden to these things. Well, that's the hope. In the methods, is the dietary comparator fully described or the placebo or however it's being uh, uh, handled? And that is really abused by authors submitting papers. Was the randomization based on nutrient intake? Yes, no, but justified, not applicable. Was blinding, limits to blinding fully described? And this is a really unique 
aspect of human nutrition design. It may be hard, if not impossible to do, but you can blind some of them. If you can describe, maybe the participants can't be blinded because they've got eyes and they can see <laughs> differences, but the staff who delivered the intervention, the analytical staff might be blinded. Provide an explanation. Do the primary outcomes followed by a secondary outcomes follow trial registration include clinical, public health, and statistical relevance as appropriate? Are ancillary studies fully described? Has key nutritional relevance been adequately described? I, and therefore, is it like generalizable with consideration of the background diet and population? Intent to treat versus per protocol, the statistical versus clinical relevance. Have influencing factor events been fully discussed, like the choice of comparator and all the elements we described above. And now this is um, more emphasis overall. Certainly NIH has picked it up and USDA is on the way. Are the data, especially those uh, paid for by the taxpayer, but it should be true of private industry funded research as well, made publicly available. That really increases the credibility. And at the time the consort was developed in 2010, that wasn't really an emphasis like it is now. So to address whether papers were doing this anyway, all of these factors that we thought were best practices, we thought we would take eight studies, some of which are really classic in the nutrition field and well uh, described and utilized, and some are kind of newer, but we wanted to include a wide range of types of nutrition trials. Now they've all passed peer review in high quality journals, so they have a lot of strengths, but we were trying to say, are there elements that are missing that would have improved our ability to understand, interpret the results or to reproduce the studies if necessary based on our guidelines. So it's a retrospective look at uh, as though they were being evaluated on our nutrition extension checklist. So you had the Women's Health Initiative, the calcium and vitamin D trial, which is a supplement trial. The VITAL trial is also omega-3 fatty acids and vitamin D. So you have two supplement trials. Then you have diet intervention trials like a low fat diet in the WHI. And you have the DASH uh, or DASH sodium diet that we use that study. You have the Predimed. Um, then you have uh, behavior modifications like upbeat. And then the non-nutritive sweetener trial was a, a new study that capitalizes on omics, a lot of omic outcomes, and that's what's coming. We use scores for these different nutrition extension guideline criteria of minus one to two. So a two means they addressed the issue adequately and they pretty much met our criteria. A one means they partially addressed it, but incompletely. A zero meant it wasn't addressed or, or we couldn't find it. And a minus one meant there was misinformation that you could misinterpret the outcomes because of how it was reported. So you can go through these studies and see how we addressed it. Um, here's two of the three sections of that evaluation to show we did have the full range of minuses to two. I'm gonna take one of the studies and give you some of the components of this nutrition uh, um, extension criteria and the scores and explanation for the score to give you the idea. So. Take the WHI calcium and vitamin D intervention trial. So the title we gave a zero, meaning did not include the recommendations of the intervention and primary finding clearly stated. 
randomized controlled trial specified, population identified. This is their title, calcium plus vitamin D and risk of fractures. You can't tell if it's a trial. It can be a literature review, <laughs> a narrative review of the literature. You have no information to judge what kind of a study that is. On background and objectives, biological plausibility, the population is affected. We gave it a one, that's a partial. So they told it was for postmenopausal women, but no biological plausibility was given. So that's why we gave the score of the one. The length of the intervention was not given, so a zero. The purpose of the study and the novelty clearly stated, it was described. The trial design aligned with the scientific question be addressed, well described. On participants, eligibility to, related to baseline nutrition status, eligibility for settings and locations if applicable. The background status wasn't considered and locations were not discussed in this paper. On interventions, the details of the diet related intervention comparators described compliance assessment clear. We're probably too generous by giving it a two because the supplement details and compliance were clear, but the comparator was not described. The outcomes, the biochemical of exposure was described well, and randomization based on nutrient intake or status if relevant, not done. It was a very large sample size, and this is especially a problem if it's a small sample size. Blinding, not described. Per protocol intention to, dis to treat analysis described, the ITT was specified. On limitations, did they account for all of these items that I've been discussing? Those errors were not discussed in their interpretation. And um, the delivery of the intervention as intended was well described, but data accessibility was not discussed. So it could be improved. Here are the two publications that have come out so far from the work of this group and the Delphi round results will be uh, submitted by Friday, we think. The Delphi survey part was a two round survey of 38 nutrition trial experts from broad geographical range to establish consensus of our proposed nutrition extension checklist items. We had more than 90% consensus on 21 of the items Two items required uh, additional clarification and of the 29, and there are still a few that we're taking to this consensus meeting in Oxford at the end of the month to try to resolve. Okay, shifting gears now to get a little bit more specific relative to interests of the Office of Dietary Supplement and maybe many on this call is Specifically, how do you go about making public health recommendations for diet and disease links? So you first identify a link, maybe through observational studies, and you build the scientific evidence. Then when it's rigorous enough, then health regulators and policymakers interpret it and then our food supply might be altered through designing new food products or choice of menus, et cetera. So a background for trials on bioactives and supplements. Uh, Barbara mentioned this work that uh, I helped her, she was the lead on, described in an editorial for supplements on specific for plant foods and dietary supplements building solid foundations for clinical trials. And one article that I led in this supplement was taking those best practice guidelines from the CTSA ASN project and adapt them specifically for plant-based interventions with examples from plant-based, um, plant-derived intervention trials. So this work, as with the CTSA ASN partnership, was taking what's out there already, not trying to recreate or uh, develop new practices the way that um, the FINS activity is, but it's to collate and interpret because adoption of best practices 
for, in this case, chemically complex natural products and translation of clinical trial results will provide a more solid foundation for building the evidence base for the use of nat natural products for health. So what has been done by different efforts that I've been part of is this paper with uh, Allison Yates is the first author in advances in nutrition that came out in 2021. It was a working group appointed by ILSI North America and um, finished by IFANS uh, with a lot of leaders in making dietary advice to the public. And the idea was to think of how would you create a DRI-like process this time not for essential nutrients, but for bioactive dietary substances. So we did that over a couple of years of meeting in person, many Zoom calls and emails. And in 2021, we published in Advances Nutrition our conclusions. To evaluate what we did, why is the framework for bioactive intakes needed now? Without evidence-based recommendations, consumers utilize information from unreliable sources. The framework was developed for a wide range of audience. It could be um, for researchers designing studies, for policymakers, for uh, manufacturers of foods, for editors, for journals. It, so it's tended to be used by credible national and international health and government organizations and all users of dietary advice for bioactive foods and ingredients. What health outcomes were used to and can be used to quantify recommended dietary bioactive intakes? We took the ones that have been listed by FDA and some of the examples are given here that these have been shown to be good biomarkers of health and disease. And we developed a process. The sequential process forms the framework to evaluate the health benefits of bioactives. So step one is characterize the bioactive. This one, ODS, uh, is really emphasizes. You have to characterize your bioactive compounds and determine that the intake is quantified by a reliable intake exposure or a validated biomarker. Evaluate the safety. Make sure that there's no adverse health events. If you fail here, you shouldn't go any further, really. On the third, conduct an efficacy review of the literature. Fourth, you decide on the recommendation. And our advice was you don't do go forward with anything that has less than moderate quality. So it's either going to be moderate or high. And we even formulated how you should express it. So based on either moderate or high quality evidence, the recommendation is made to consume between, and a, a range is appropriate for a bioactive, unlike an essential nutrient that may have a specific cutoff, but a range since it's non-essential of daily intake of and quantity of a certain bioactive to and list what it's been shown to do, what health outcome benefit. The first publication to utilize this framework guideline was for flavin 3 oils and cardiometabolic health. So they concluded after um, extensive review that there was moderate level of evidence supporting cardiometabolic protection resulting from flavin-3 all intake. Um, and they recommended a range of 400 to 600 milligrams a day was supported by the literature with this supporting um, level of evidence. So I spent most of my time in polyphenol rich fruits where the leading, leading candidate of the benefits of uh, fruits and vegetables for bone health is the polyphenol level. We showed that blueberries prevented bone loss in postmenopausal women by 6%. That was related to shifts in gut microbial populations, changes in microbial diversity and taxidominus 
But there's an interplay between polyphenols and the gut microbiota, and it depends on dose and matrix. So the food is not the same as the supplement, which can vary considerably. The, the blueberry extract supplement did not have the fiber and skin and so forth of the fruit. It had many more times, like 10 times the polyphenol content of the fruit. So you have to have a separate consideration for supplements. So once uh, such a work is underway, we have formed a committee led by Janet Novotny, and we're working through all of these aspects to develop a similar framework as was done for the bioactive foods for supplements. So take home messages. A strong evidence base in nutrition is the foundation for nutrition policy. Both ASN and FINS and other groups have been working to improve di design, documentation, and reporting. Frameworks for recommending intake ranges for bioactive substances and supplements are evolving, but it depends on you as a field, as a group, to adopt guidance, utilize them, interpret them, and increase the rigor of the evidence base to make good dietary guidance. Thank you. There we go, now I'm unmuted. Thank you so much, Connie. That was fabulous as a number of people have already said in the chat and quite a tour on um, a couple of really good questions in the chat already. Um, uh, maybe we can deal with the first one fairly quickly. Um, what about companies that are producing um, nutritional interventions, dietary supplements? Um, are they going to, given the cost and the time, especially to do rigorous trials, um, are they going to want to do them? Well, I think it's going to take a partnership. I, I think the um, margin on food is pretty small for f funding research, but the public is interested in it. So uh, there are some partnerships in place between um, government and industry, and I think that needs to be strengthened. But it, but it starts with having the frameworks for what level of standards and rigor are needed, and that's what we've been trying to do. And and I you know I put a comment in the chat pointing people to the consort extensions for herbal dietary supplements and for herbal traditional Chinese medicine dietary supplements, but. My point there was that these are there, but I am so glad that you are work, working on this for dietary interventions because it's not clear to me that either of them really requ requests the kind of information that you're putting in these, requesting in these, um, and that is really necessary to understand uh, nutritional intervention clearly and be able to replicate it without which, as you've said, it can't form a solid foundation for further work, never mind recommendations for, for public practice. Um, so uh, there are a couple of questions in the chat about the locus of review, which you so beautifully pointed out that you are pushing with, with these guidelines. You are telling people you are going to need to have this information to submit your publication. So you'd better be thinking about it as you're designing your trial. Right. But what that points up, and that a couple of people have commented in the review, is that, you know, and and that and you've implicitly suggested reviewers are not necessarily looking at all of these things, even as they're reviewing papers for the journals. But why are we funding clinical trials that are labor intensive for the scientists, for the clinical coordinators, for the participants, um, without doing sufficient review at the at the application level and at the IRB level. Um, if, if not at the, you know, you can put a clinical trial into clinicaltrials.gov and that's not reviewed at that point for whether it's, um, you know, are, are, are you actually designed to test the question that you're asking? So, um, you know, and the problem there, and maybe this is not the place to discuss this, or maybe it is, is 
reviewer effort is for the most part volunteer on top of people's already busy schedules. Any thoughts? Well, I would love to figure out how we could have a checkpoint at the trial design stage. I would say um, uh, ODS partnering with NICCH has taken a leadership role because you are requiring um, good evidence of the characterization of the natural products be in your grant submissions. More efforts are needed like that, but I don't know how and where we could put a checkpoint in all trial designs. It, it, that's um, where the funding agencies have to come in and demand more of that, I'd say. So many great questions. Um, let me give you one from David Murray, the Office of Diet of Disease Prevention Director. He asks what proportion of clinical trials of nutrition involve a behavioral intervention component, coaching, interaction with the nutritionist or dietitian, et cetera. Any, any sense of that? I There are a lot of behavior intervention trials, but they're not the classic ones that have informed dietary guidelines for Americans, for example, so much. It, maybe more this round than ever before, I suppose. But when I was on it in 2005, it was the studies like the DASH diet intervention, the uh, e efficacy trials that really influenced the recommendations. It wasn't the be behavior modifications. In fact, we kept one of our strongest recommendations was we need more expertise on behavior evaluations well, in our teams. We have an office in our division that it. Um, has expertise in that. So, um, and I'd coming? like, I have a hand raised from Dan Rayton. Um, so Dan, um, would you like to unmute and um, or I'll make sure you're unmuted and ask your question. Hi, Connie, through the force as usual, this was great. As you know, um, this is an area that is of great interest. Uh, I know Drew's on the call, I think, and maybe he could speak a little bit to the role of uh, the Office of Nutrition Research. Hello? Yeah, Drew's on. Okay. Um, th this is something that uh, is of great interest to us. You know, our efforts with regards to the nutrition ecology is really trying to get at a more comprehensive uh, view of nutrition and, and to increase precision, rigor, and reproducibility. Um, my specific question is, and, and, and I'm sorry if I missed it, but have you interfaced with organizations like ARC, U.S. Public Health Services Task Force, uh, Academy of Nutrition Dietetics uh, Evidence Analysis Center, those folks that are doing um, uh, uh, systematic reviews to develop guidelines to ensure that they are integrating this approach into what they're doing, Cochrane as well. So, so uh, on a lot of different uh, projects, I've interacted with all those groups, but I, I will say that that Flavanol 3 paper that was the first paper to use the bioactive foods uh, framework did it with uh, the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics and the evidence-based review was done through their uh, grading system and whatnot. So, and all the efforts that I'm involved with now where different groups are saying, what if we evaluated compound or food X using the framework? Every time we say, let's go to Academy of Nutrition Dietetics that's set up, not only are they set up to do the process for a, a good uh, grading evidence-based review, but then they have the audience to translate the public recommend health recommendations too widely in the registered dietitians. Just one other quick question. One of the areas that is a growing interest is this intersection of climate and food systems, diet, nutrition, health. Um, one of the real challenges there is the metric measure measures and metrics um, are very different and challenging in the context of uh, a, a nutrition study. Have you explored any of those issues with regard to the challenges related to differences in measures and metrics? I think, there's, I think there's several aspects that need to 
start with our the work I presented and go from here. One is climate, but also uh, all the omics. We need definitions and processes for how to proceed ahead with the uh, results from personalized nutrition. So Andrew, your office that's doing um, all of us and whatnot would be a great group to help. You're probably learning faster than anybody what uh, are the pitfalls and considerations to make for good reporting generally in that space. But the groups I've worked on so far didn't feel like we had the expertise to address either climate or the omics type of research. Yeah, no, and I think you 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 provide an opportunity, you, you highlight an opportunity to, to to really synergize and have these discussions across all these groups as as this as this sheer volume of data is becoming available. How to how to do things in a coordinated fashion. Right. So you're spot on, Connie, as always. <laughs> And and we are actually at two minutes past the hour, and I don't want to impose on your time, Connie. I'm so grateful to have you. There are great questions in the chat, and I'm going to forward them to you, or I can, if I, I don't know whether you're able to stay on. I don't know what your teaching schedule is. You can stay is. on for a little while, yeah. And and people are hanging in there. Almost 80% are still on. So wow. <laughs> I will, um, questions that we haven't addressed at all, circadian timing, which may be super important for dietary interventions, um, and doc, I, I, are you gonna address documenting that, um, which is a whole nother complication? And then um, some comments about, you know, are we, if, if so many of these trials, the majority of them are not including critical information, are, do we need better training? Well, absolutely better training. I, you know, the circadian rhythm part is another one of those items that we need to take what the, the foundation some of these groups have worked on and take it further. Add circadian rhythm to climate and uh, the omics, uh, things that need to be addressed. But training, absolutely. Those ASN workshops were a really good start, but um we need it uh, adopted, incorporated. I sure try to do it in my lab, and and so do all the other authors of these works. But then beyond that, how do we keep it from being just a one-off experience with an interactive workshop and be uh, incorporated into routine practices? And and keep it updated. For example, char chemical characterization of nutrition. That's a constantly improving area of science, um, behavioral interventions, I mean, food is, eating is a behavior. Yeah, after absolutely. All. And, and David Murray points out very appropriately that those are um, very, um, have their own expertise and experts that we should probably bring into this discussion. And then there's a question, more specific question about um, potential um, bioactive constituents in foods. Um, and how, how would, what, what, is, what was the group's thinking on identifying safety in those constituents, um, especially if you're going to be enriching them in a dietary supplement as opposed to in diet, um, given that a lot of the supporting data for that, a lot of the safety data are from rodent studies. Right. So. The, the general thinking on safety was consider that first as a priority because if, if you don't have a safety check, then why bother going to see if it is efficacious on any health outcome? The best, you know, and that's the reason the group with the bioactive foods decided to stop short of saying anything about supplements because it was such a, different can of worms, you can get a whole different dose and matrix because with foods, you can do um, historical consumption. You know, if people have been eating food X for decades and there's no um, outbreaks of any kind or adverse events, you can be fairly certain it's going to be safe or you have to start there. But with supplements, it's a whole different thing. 
So, you know, the FDA classic <clears throat> evaluation is a 90 day toxicity study, which is what we did for the blueberry extract. And it's a start. You might miss some things, but um, yeah, how do you get it safety? But we're so terrible at even reporting at or collecting adverse events. You know, we're very sloppy as researchers about adverse event uh, collection and reporting and interpreting. So you can go to the literature and not learn very much. I think there's a perception that these are things that we're already taking in, so they must be safe, no matter no mm -hmm. matter the dose and the intervention form. Um, so I think we're, I'm not seeing too many more questions coming in. I apologize to any of you who've asked great questions that I've missed in the trail. I will be forwarding them to Dr. Weaver. And Connie, thank you so much for being okay. so generous with your time and your wisdom. And such a great talk, and such and thanks to all of you for the great discussion. And please come back next month for the ODS webinar. Thank you. Bye.